take a focus on what happened there in the Golden State, that special election this last week. We had Republican congressional candidate Mike Garcia. He successfully flipped the 25th district in that special election after Democratic Representative Katie Hill resigned last year. Welcome, Katie Hill. Welcome back to Hysteria. Thanks. We're so happy to have you back. Glad to be back. Thank you. Um, first of all, um, how are you doing? Oh, man. Uh, that's like a loaded question, I feel like. But, um, you know, I'm... I'm okay. The results of the election were pretty horrible. And, um, you know, in a way it was kind of what we were expecting. Um, but you obviously didn't ever want that. And, um, at, you know, it's just, it's just like one thing on top of another in life and, and figuring out a way to get up and brush yourself mm -hmm. off and move forward. So mm -hmm. I was, I was a kid, uh, when I was a kid, I rode horses. I still own a horse and, the biggest thing that you were taught was when you fall off, you get back up and get right back on. Um, and that's just kind of, I guess, what life is. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, drilling down into that trauma a little bit, the last <laughs> week was, was the special election in California's 25th. For everyone listening, uh, what happened and were you surprised? Well... I think the biggest factor, honestly, is just people in a special election, Democrats don't show up. And you've got the, the red, um, you know, Republican base that was particularly riled up because of my scandal and excited for the opportunity to take the seat back. I mean, that was that was literally what they were plotting. They were trying to, you know, to to find something. They they found something. They exploited it. They got me to resign and they saw this as their opportunity to um, take back the seat that they felt was stolen from them in the first place. And they really did not think that it was possible for someone like me, let alone any Democrat, to win there. Um, so I think that they really, really rallied around this opportunity. And from what we know, they actually did some very, despite the fact that you hear them complain all the time about ballot harvesting, um, they had some very organized efforts around ballot harvesting. And um, you know, good for them for figuring it out because like, you know, that's, it's, to me, it's, it's about helping people be able to vote, but the churches were really mobilized, um, in getting people to, you know, providing drop-off centers and saying that they're going to mail them for you. So if you swing by the church and, you know, do it in your car or whatever. Um, and I, we just didn't have something like that. And I think you can also partly attribute it to the fact that Democrats were, were pretty distant chanted by things, right? Like you're, you got to be really, really frustrated to have worked so hard and felt like you were finally, and, and this is what I heard over and over, was that you felt like you were finally represented and um, to have that all go away so quickly is, um, is really disenchanting. Okay, so there was a special election in California's 25th. There was a special election in Wisconsin's 7th. We both know that, you know, these are anic anecdotal elections and every district is different, but you can still kind of extrapolate things on a, maybe on a larger scale from this. Like, do you think that Democrats should see what happened in your special, or your former seat special election as a wake up call? I do. Um, I think that it shows that, you know, remember mine was one of the quote unquote safest swing seats, right? Hillary Clinton won by seven, I won by nine. Um, this isn't one of the seats that should have been at risk. So what it means is that, you know, depending on what things are looking like in November, especially depending on the energy that's coming from the right, then, uh, you know, districts like the ones that we flipped that were, um, you know, that were ones that, that Trump won by 16 points are really, really ones we need to watch out for. Um, so we shouldn't give up uh, or stop paying attention to the House just because the Senate is looking like it's within reach or um, obviously we want the presidency. Uh, so, you know, that, to me, that's the biggest wake up call, first and foremost. The second is that as we are adapting to this mail-in strategy, how are we doing that, right? Field is what has been our strongest, most important get out the vote effort, right? And that's modified. I don't think we should give up on it altogether. And I think the Republicans didn't give up on it altogether. Um, they, have a, they have a different base of people who they can go to and they can, you know, reliably answer, that will reliably answer their phones and that they can... Um, you know, get to do things like drop off ballots at churches, but we're going to have to modify field programs um, to to frankly make sure people know how to vote uh, by mail when they have many, many of them have never done it before, especially in these kind of lower turnout areas um, to begin with, which are usually the most democratically held. Katie, 
beyond even just mail-in, how do we re-engage the Democrats that helped you win by nine points when now they're also facing the pandemic, childcare challenges, unemployment, and things that are just like so catastrophic? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think, well, I am hopeful that the loss actually was a wake up call for a lot of people um, that might have thought like, oh, well, the seat will be fine. Um, now they're like, okay, I have really have to vote. Part of, I mean, honestly, I think that the, the district itself is Democratic leaning enough now that if we get the turnout that, you know, is usually expected in a November election, I think she will win. Um, and, you know, we saw that. We saw that happen with the Ossoff special when Lucy McBath won in the general. Um, and I think we're going to see that in this case. Um, but it's still, uh, you know, it's something that can't be taken for granted. And in terms of the support that I had, like the, the volunteers who mobilized around it, I think that's the, that's going to be the same thing, right? Is how do you figure out ways of um, ways of getting involved that may not mean moving, you know, leaving your house um, and how do we get people excited about it and um, especially when the Senate isn't in play in California and the, um, you know, the, obviously the electoral votes are going to be there for Joe Biden no matter what. So I think, I think what it has to be is like maybe, you know, maybe the approach isn't like, gee, let's get so excited about getting this seat back because like that, that ship has sailed. I think maybe it's more like, oh, you motherfuckers, hell no. And we need to <laughs> kind of like stand up and take what's ours. So. Uh-huh. Um, okay, you said the word motherfuckers. Let's expand on that a little bit because because uh, we we chatted briefly about this uh, about this race and how personal it was to you and how personal it was considering the person who ended up winning the seat. Can you talk a little mm-hmm. bit about the people who helped uh, promote uh, Christy Smith's opponent? Sure. So the first slew of images that came out was through the publicly came out was through. Um, red state, this online mm-hmm. And these are Im- images of you that were released without your yeah. consent that ended right. up leading Taken to... without my consent. Taken, and taken without your consent. Got it. Um, and the only person that could have done that was my ex-husband, although he's denied it. Um, and so it's a... It, so that started at red state. The person who published those, you know, who, who was the investigative reporter doing that, um, has been a longtime Republican, you know, operative in the region who, who writes, I guess, on the side. Um, I honestly don't really know what, I, I know that writing is, is, is not a full-time thing for her. Um, and she had worked for one of my previous opponents. She had worked for Steve Knight in the past. And the day after, the day after I resigned, she endorsed Mike Garcia. Um, there were a number of other people who were involved, like, and, and again, this is information that's circling through like Facebook groups and through, you know, uh, the random people that are on the ground. And it's not, it's not like a NIF or a court case or anything like that, but so many of the people who were supporting Mike Garcia from the beginning were the ones that we knew had the photos. Um, and some of that is, is actually on blogs that are still posted out there with, uh, Joe Messina and, and things like that. So I think, um, for me, that that was the the biggest thing, right? Like it was it was clear that Mike Garcia was the favorite before all of this came out. Um, he was he was a good candidate to begin with. I mean, he's got the the fighter pilot background. Then on top of that, he was you know he's got a he, he's a Mexican American and he's got a Latino last name and and with a district that's heavily Latino, that might matter. So um, th- there were those things, but yeah, it was it was all of the people on the ground that were involved in in my husband getting the images out there then them making that into the the national scandal that it was um were the ones behind Garcia in the first place and and um you know I don't think that Garcia himself had anything to do with it uh but it's still it's still you know pretty painful mhm is there a world, given that, is there a world where you would re-enter politics again beyond the kind of behind-the-scenes role that you're taking now? It's hard to imagine wanting to do that, <laughs> honestly. Um, I, I'm, I'm still pretty young, right? I'm 32. I went into and left Congress before I turned 33. I think that, like, there's, there's a lot of time left in my life, and hopefully, fingers crossed, um, but it's not, it's not something I foresee in the immediate future at all. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's, 
and and not for you know not for my own purposes I guess as much as it is like I don't need to open that back up for my family for you know anybody else so if if something comes up where it feels right and I feel like the you know the support is there and I have the emotional and mental capacity to to do it then I'm I'm open to it right but Mm -hmm. that, that time isn't now okay um, and I, before, uh, before we wrap, I want to end on a, on an up note. Um, what have you been doing during this strange stay at home time that has made you happy or that has at least given you some like release and catharsis? Okay. Well, before the election, I was like pretty, well, I, I was writing my book. I finished my book. I was, oh, congrats you know, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, so that kept me pretty busy. And then, um, and then I got a kitten and I'm so <gasps> glad I got the kitten before I got the, uh, before I got the bad news. <laughs> um, and then I, um, afterwards though, I like, I took two days of just like not wanting to do anything except for get off the couch. And then I got on the scale and I was like, Oh no. And so <laughs> since then I've been very motivated to cook and work out and I've decided I was like I have nothing else to do right now like this is the only time in my life that I can think of where I'm not totally busy where I have zero excuses not to be able to cook and work out like there's no time reason that I can't do this and I'm like I'm just like before we come out of hiding again like I'm gonna be in good shape that's my that's my goal (laughs) look it worked for Sarah Connor in Terminator 2 so why can't it work for all of us I make this reference all the time but I find her to be an inspiration and I'm excited that you're Linda Hamiltoning that's uh, (laughs) a that's great news Katie um well thank thank you so much for stopping by um you know we're sorry about the election but we're Looking forward to winning it back with you in November and helping Christy Smith be the new congressman for the 25th. Absolutely. Thanks, guys. All right. Thank you. you.